folks this lesson is on, well, the organization of the nervous system and the different divisions of the human nervous system. You do have in your handouts, again, some blanks that go along with this. So as we're walking through it, you can be filling in the information on the handouts that you have as well. So the nervous system, yes, you only have one nervous system in your body, but we just divide it up into different branches. So if you kind of think about the circulatory system, we only have one circulatory system, but we divide it into the heart and the blood vessels, the arteries, the veins, the blood. So kind of similar with the nervous system, we just have different divisions that we do talk about. So the first uh, major division that we do have here, we divide it into what's referred to as the central nervous system. That is also abbreviated CNS. And the central nervous system really involves just two structures. That is the brain and the spinal cord, which run down the center of your body. And that's why it is referred to, yes, as the central nervous system. So that's it for the central nervous system. Those are the two major branches. Eventually, we'll go on to talking about the brain. And yes, we'll talk about many subdivisions, areas within the brain as well, and functions of different areas within the brain. And we'll also take a look at the spinal cord and a cross-section through the spinal cord. But in terms of the major divisions, that is it for the central nervous system. A little bit more complicated on the right-hand side with the peripheral nervous system. So central means, well, down the middle. Periphery means away from the central part. So anything outside of the brain and the spinal cord is considered the peripheral nervous system or the PNS. So we're going to divide this one further into what is referred to as the motor and the sensory systems. So kind of think of it this way, motor information involves information for the most part going to your muscles that involve movement. So motor is associated with movement. So in the case with the motor system, what we always have are what are called motor neurons. Neurons are the nerve cells. Motor neurons that are carrying information from the central nervous system to the periphery. When we talk about the other division here, sensory, so kind of think about your, well, five different senses. I have a picture of the ear here, but your other senses as well. So now what you're doing is you're taking information that's typically coming from outside of your body. It doesn't have to be from outside. We'll talk about some other ones, but you're detecting something inside or outside of your body. And then what you need to do is you need to carry that information in the opposite information as the motor pathway. So that's now going toward the central nervous system and that would be involving what are called the sensory neurons, carrying information toward the CNS. So those are the two major branches of the peripheral nervous system, either going away from or going toward the central nervous system. The motor, we can divide up even further, and this one we divide up into what is referred to as the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is not under voluntary control. We might have some influence over it, but in general, it's over, it's under involuntary control. So if we talk about one example, your pupils in your eye, determining the size of your pupils, that is controlled by the muscle around the outside of your pupil, which is called the iris. So that is not under your voluntary control, which means that is part of the autonomic nervous system. For the other division, the somatic nervous system, these are the ones that are under voluntary control. So if we think about your muscles that are usually connected to your bones, which are called your skeletal muscles. So in this picture here, we're talking about the leg. We can see the leg, a portion of the leg, the hamstrings at the back, the quadriceps at the front. So those are under voluntary control. So they would be part of the somatic division of the motor system. So in both cases though, again, information is going from the central to the periphery, only for the autonomic, it's not under voluntary control, involuntary, and for somatic, it is under voluntary control. So we have one more division here, and that's dividing the autonomic nervous system into what are referred to as something that we did see briefly before, uh, what's referred to as the sympathetic nervous system. And the opposite of this is the parasympathetic nervous system. So these are portions of the nervous system that, again, are under that category of involuntary control. 
and they involve the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is activated during a stress situation. There are many, many different kinds of stresses. It can be physical stress. Physical stress might include injury. Physical stress might include exercise. It can be emotional stress. It can be psychological or mental stress. It doesn't matter. Your nervous system doesn't distinguish between these. It treats them all as the same and it activates the sympathetic nervous system. So what I like to think of is think S for stress, S for sympathetic. So think about all of the things that happen when you start to exercise. That's exactly the same thing that's going to happen when you have psychological stress, when you have emotional stress, when you have an injury. So what are some of the things that I'm talking about? Your heart rate increases your breathing rate increases, you start to perspire. Those are all effects of exercise because it's a stress, but those are also the effects that you would get for other kinds of stressors as well. So this is also referred to as the fight or flight response. Your body is now making the decision, I need to do something to deal with this stress. Is this something where I stick around and I fight whatever that stress is to deal with it? Or is it something where I get the heck out of there? So again, also the fight or flight response. Parasympathetic is exactly the opposite. So this is a non-stress situation. So whatever you get for the sympathetic response, the parasympathetic is going to be exactly the opposite. So for sympathetic, we said that your heart rate goes up, your breathing rate goes up. For the parasympathetic, it would be the opposite. The heart rate would go down and the breathing rate would go down as well. So many, many different targets. We'll see um, other examples of this as well. But yes, it could be like your airway passages that we're talking about, the heart, as I mentioned as well, and um, some other internal organs in your body that might also be affected. This one is showing the pancreas here that are affected by the autonomic nervous system. Again, this is not under voluntary control, so you would not be able to um, consciously, for example, change the diameter of your blood vessels, but realize that you can have some influence over some things that we do consider autonomic. So your breathing rate is under autonomic control, but we do still have some voluntary control over that one. So a little bit of crossover for uh, some of the examples here. You also have a blank that looks like this. So um, what this one is showing us is some really important information in terms of the kinds of neurons and the direction that information is going. So let's start with the right hand side here. So what it's showing is taking information in from the external environment. So when you take information in through the external environment, it is through your senses. So in your skin, you have receptors for heat and cold and pain and touch and pressure. You have your ears for sound, you have your eyes for light and so on. So that information that you're taking in through the exter from the external environment, it needs to pass toward the central nervous system and it's sensory neurons that's going to take that information there. It may involve a motor response as well. So if the external environment happens to be a very bright light, then when that information goes to the central nervous system, you need to have a response that's carried out. And that response is going to be to protect your eyes, the back of your eyes, the retina on your eyes from the very, very bright light. So there would be motor neurons that go to your iris and they would cause your iris to contract and that would decrease the size of your pupil so less light comes in. So that's information that's coming from the external environment then. And once again, we're really just talking about the, the five different senses. So I have here touch, so that would involve the skin, but touch in fact is a little bit more complicated than just touch receptors. Your skin is a very complicated organ and um, many different kinds of receptors that we do have in the skin. The other side is from the internal environment. So in addition to taking a sampling of things from outside of your body, you also need to measure things inside of your body. And we've already talked about a whole bunch of these things that need to be maintained through homeostasis. So it's the amount of sodium. It's the amount of water that's in your body. All of these are internal. It's the temperature of your body. So we have a number of different kinds of receptors 
baroreceptors. Briefly, this was mentioned before on that quick lesson on regulatory systems. They measure blood pressure. Osmoreceptors, they're for water and salt, like potassium and like sodium. Chemoreceptors, hydrogen ions, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and a stretch receptor. So stretch receptors are located in muscles and in tendons. And when they are well stretched, then that is still the internal environment. Even though it might be something from the outside that is causing the stretching, these receptors, the stretching is in the muscles and the tendons, so that is the internal environment. So once again, what we see is that um, information is passed from sensory neurons going to the central nervous system so that information can be processed about blood pressure, osmotic pressure, different kinds of ions, carbon dioxide and water, and the stretching. So if we take a look at this last one here again, so if we do have a muscle or tendon that is being stressed, the internal environment, that information is sent to the central nervous system. And then what you need to have is some sort of a response in order to minimize the stretching of those muscles and tendons so you don't have damage that has taken place. So motor neurons will send information to muscles and that will minimize the stretching and minimize the potential for harm. A little bit more on the autonomic nervous system then because it is so important for you to understand this. So once again, we already saw this. It is not under voluntary control. You may be able to have some voluntary influence over it, like your breathing rate, but ultimately your autonomic nervous system is going to take over. And of course, you don't need to be awake, you don't need to be conscious in order to have these autonomic nervous system effects. Their function really is to maintain homeostasis, as we already saw, branches of the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And really important for you to keep in mind that they are opposing responses. You'll see a picture in your textbook, you'll see a picture in your handout, and I'll give you another picture in a second here. But once again, this uh, picture that we show here is just kind of indicating that they are opposing effects. And the point is to maintain this balance, this fine balance, maintaining homeostasis. So for the parasympathetic, really kind of keep in mind this. It is a non-stress situation where the parasympathetic is more active. It is a stress any kind of stress situation where the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. So let's just take a look at uh, some of the bigger ones that we do see. So sympathetic, preparing your body for stress. So dilating your pupils to take in as much information as possible from the external environment. Increasing the heart rate, saw that one before, increasing the breathing rate, increasing blood pressure, and increasing blood glucose. Now notice that for the parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic nervous system, it's just exactly the opposite. Sympathetic dilates, parasympathetic constricts. Increase heart rate versus decrease heart rate. They're all the opposite. And that's the idea behind pictures like this one here as well. Sometimes they have them flipped around and parasympathetic is on the right, sympathetic on the left. Doesn't really matter. What it shows is the opposing effects. So sympathetic, what does it do? Dilates the pupils. Parasympathetic constricts the pupils. Heart rate, we saw this, increases. Heart rate decreases. Airway passages, dilate to take more oxygen in. Constrict because you don't need as much in the non-stress situation. A bunch of these other ones have to do with digestion. So salivary glands responsible for producing, well, the saliva, including the digestive enzyme amylase, you don't really need to be concerned about that in a stress situation. The stomach, digesting proteins, releasing hydrochloric acid, solubilizing the food that you've taken into your body. You don't really need to be concerned about that. It's not a priority in a stress situation. The intestines, peristalsis, moving food through your digestive system, not something that you need to be concerned about in a stress situation. So in all cases, those that are not a priority, they're inhibited. Inhibition, inhibition, inhibition. It is during the parasympathetic, rest and digest, remember, non-stress is parasympathetic. 
it's there that we have those actions turned on. So stimulating, if there is food that's going through the digestive system, the salivary glands, stimulating activity within the stomach and within the intestines as well.